speech and move. Beach and when he graduates this summer, fingers crossed, will be my 20th PhD and uh, definitely one of my most productive. Um, he will be t talking his talk over the full span of designing efficient deep neural networks and a lot of the research agenda uh, is our agendas that he himself has, has identified and driven. I think you're fair. Um, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for attending my dissertation talk. Um, so my topic today is uh, efficient deep neural networks. So let's get started. Um, so first of all, a little bit of background. Uh, so in recent years, we have witnessed the success of uh, deep neural network in many areas, and it's commonly believed that. The success, is, the success is attributed to three factors, uh, more data, more complex model, and more compute. So the, the reason behind that is once we collect more data, we need to build more uh, larger models with you know, more parameters and more flop to, to digest all this data. And in order to run those uh, models, we need to build more powerful processors to, to train and, uh, and to run them. So, um, but however, there's a problem with this is, which is, you know, the computational complexity of neural network today is already very large, such that they are only good for, you know, GPUs or data center clusters, but they're probably not good for edge devices such as mobile phones or IoT devices or, or wearable devices and so on. But at the same time, the, the demand to run deep neural network on the edge is also growing fast. So here are some of the reasons. The first one is the privacy concern. So sometimes you don't want to upload your data to the cloud. And sometimes uh, many applications require a, has a latency constraint to uh, interact with their environment in a real-time manner. And in some other uh, applications, perhaps the, there's no uh, easy access to the internet or it's not reliable. So we have to run uh, the, the, the deep neural networks on the edge. However, the, the, the problem is uh, when it is on the edge, uh, a lot of those factors are no longer available. So first of all, well, we no longer have powerful processors. Instead, we have to run uh, the neural network on some uh, processors with limited uh, compute and power budget. And as a result, we can no longer use very powerful models. We have to have a lot of constraint over the parameter size, the flops, or the energy, and so on. And in many, many applications, um, getting data is actually very difficult because um, for example, the LiDAR point cloud data is extremely uh, difficult to, uh, collecting is okay, but annotate is very, very difficult. So without uh, the, the amount of uh, training data, how do we still uh, train the neural network? So, so now the question is, without three vectors, right, can we still successfully apply the neural nets? So in this talk, my focus is going to be um, uh, focusing on the improving the efficiency of deep neural network at four levels. The first one is model efficiency. So can we design uh, the same accurate and uh, uh, capable models, but with much lower complexity? The other one is the data efficiency. So um, to more specifically, can we build more advanced tools to, to help us uh, uh, annotate uh, uh, data much easier? And then a, most, a more uh, aggressive strategy is that, can we just use simulated data instead of real data uh, to, to train the neural network? And uh, another one, uh, another efficiency is hardware efficiency because if we want to optimize a system of neural network, one part is just to uh, optimize the model itself or software, but the other part is really to optimize the hardware. So can we do this co-design and achieve better efficiency? And the last one is de design efficiency, as, as I'll talk about later. So actually it takes a lot of time and computational resources in order to find the right model with good accuracy and efficiency. So the problem is, can we automate this process and provide a low cost solution? So let's get started with model efficiency. Um, in many applications, um, so it is required that we have a neural network that have high accuracy and also high efficiency. Um, it is commonly believed that those, mo so accurate models has to be large and complex, but the key question here is that, can we build a neural network to achieve the same accuracy but with lower complexity? So the answer to this question is, um, is, uh, is, so this question is partially answered by uh, inspirational principal work of SwissNet by Forrest and, uh, Forrest and Kurt and uh, the rest of the team. So it is shown that for image classification task, um, well, we can reach the same level of accuracy as AlexNet, which is a previous model, but with 50x small, uh, smaller parameter size. So this is great, so for image classification, 
But image classification is just one small set of problem of computer vision, let alone the machine learning. Um, so the key question here is that, you know, can we use this kind of lightweight neural network to first to other to deal with other computer vision uh, tasks like object detection, which is also a fundamental problem. And also, you know, the computer vision is not really limited to just uh, um, uh, it is not limited to uh, uh, the, the RGB images. But can we use the same network to process other visual modalities such as lidar, which is essentially the depth information? So to answer these two questions, let's first um, uh, take a look at uh, our work. The first one is let's list that, which is the image-based object detection. So just a little bit of background. So object detection is a fundamental computer vision task. So given the input image, we want to locate an object of interest by joining a bounding box around that and also predict its category, whether it's a car or pedestrian or so on. It is a core problem for auto driving and many other applications. And um, it requires, um, uh, in, uh, specifically in autonomous driving applications, we require a very accurate, energy efficient, and real time speed for the object uh, detector. So now the question is, you know, squeeze that is a very- You put up a bunch of pictures there. What, what are they? Oh, they are just uh, the different types of uh, autonomous vehicles. And they are using this today, if they want to use it in the future. Uh, I think, so this uh, squeeze that is, so object detection is uh, definitely used uh, uh, very widely today. Uh, but in specific for Squiz, that I think is also adopted by many. Uh, and is the MQ9 or DJI Phantom using? Uh, that I don't know. Okay. Okay. But this is kind of an illustration of it's used okay. everywhere. Yeah. So uh, now the, the, uh, then the question is Squiz, that is very small, very, very, very efficient, but can we extend that to do object detection, right? So this is our uh, design, the very high, high, uh, high level uh, in introduction. So, um, we turn SqueezeNet into SqueezeDat. The way it works is that, okay, so for a given input image, we're going to feed that into a convolutional neural net, which is SqueezeNet. Um, but instead of predicting the, uh, the probability of what, what kind of object that is, we're going to feed that into a special layer called ConfDat layer. I'll talk about that later. But the ConfDat layer is going to go through, all, uh, go through the entire image and pre predict the bound of bun bun bunny box around that. And together with that, it, it's going to contain uh, the class information of what kind of object is there or how likely it contains an object, and then we can do this filtering to get the final detections. And what this that is, is, is essentially a, another convolutional layer, but it's trained to predict the output that can be decoded into bounding boxes. For example, so at the input feature map, it's going to go through each position and produce uh, this many output. So the K here is just number of uh, possible object that can exist at one position. Four is just uh, four coordinate for the center and width and height of the bunny box. One is for the confidence level of how likely it contains an object. And class is just number of classes uh, that we care about. And then this detection output at each position is going to be de decoded into the bunny boxes. So because this squeeze net is very lightweight, very efficient, and this confidence layer is just a one convolutional layer, so the, the parameter size and also the computation cost is very small. So when we build this squeeze stand and test it on a key data set, which is our driving data set, we see that compared with our previous work, it achieved a better accuracy, but with 30x smaller parameter size, 20x speed up, and 35x better energy efficiency. And we were lucky that th th this, uh, uh, this paper received the best paper award at the embedded region workshop at student PR at uh, 2017. Lucky? <laughs> I'll say that. Fortune. Fortune. Sorry. Um, so how, how did it perform with um, in situ this? Sure. So what are you comparing? To so this is uh, one of our uh, previous work that's based on test RCN, and we already kind of uh, optimized that by using a, a kind of a, a low low complexity network called Alexnet. So do, do you test it like on easy, hard, moderate, car? This is the average. Yeah, average among all them. Oh, I'm going right, right. And and just as a reference, wh what is the um, the best either then or now? So I think this number was a state of the art at that time, which is like two years ago, three years ago. Uh, but now I think this uh, the speed bar is already better, maybe ninety ish. So, okay. Yeah. So now we and as so the first. So but just to, your, your answer seems a little fuzzy. So at the time, that was a leaderboard leader in terms of accuracy. Right. So even though it was had reduced parameters. Yeah. 
So uh, now we have a that's, that's why one of us paid for it. <laughs> Wasn't one. <laughs> um, uh, we have a lot of interesting stuff to, to cover, so I'm trying to rest there. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, so with squid that we can do object detection, but what about other modalities like like lidar, right? So, so first of all, let's let's talk about you know why do we need lidar, right? And what's missing from camera? So, um, first of all, camera is not very robust towards the variation of light conditions. For example, when it gets dark, the lidar probably is not as good as when it's in the daytime. And sometimes, the, for autonomous specifically, the vehicle planning and control rely on the accurate distance measurement for the uh, obstacles. But uh, from the camera, you can, it still can uh, infer the distances, but it's sometimes it's not tricky, it's tricky, it's not very accurate. So LiDAR is a sensor that can provide very accurate and, uh, uh, and robust distance measurement. And here is an uh, example configuration of a button down LiDAR. So at each uh, time, it's going to emit 64 uh, laser rays to measure the distance from the sensor to the optical. And it's keep rotating about 2,000 pulses per round. So it's, it's collecting the, 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 the data from the, the entire environment. And it's rotating at a speed of, let's say, 10, 10 rounds per second. And uh, each point here uh, is measured by, uh, has four measurements, which is X, Y, Z coordinates in the space, and also intensity, which is the amplitude of signals received, um, uh, received by the sensor. So this intensity signal will talk the measure, which is uh, it's actually a very important uh, uh, signal to detect the object. And um, as we can see from here, as we can see from here, this is an example of lidar wind cloud. It is very sparse, very irregularly distributed in a three D space. So with this lidar wind cloud, we want to uh, detect interesting object from it or parse some information from it, so we can understand the environment. And this problem is formulated as uh, uh, lidar based detection. It's a problem that's been long studied by the research community, and the previous approaches to, uh, normally follow this pipeline. So we start from the ground segmentation, so we remove all the ground, and the remaining clusters are maybe you know cluster of interest. So we we, we, we we group them into clusters, and then throw throw each cluster into a classification. So we know that it's car or pedestrian and so on. However, the problem with the previous approaches is that you know sometimes the the because. This set, like ground segmentation, is using an iterative uh, algorithm. We have no guarantee of this runtime and sometimes even, even accuracy. So uh, the, 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 the entire um, uh, runtime is, is, not very, very, uh, is not very stable and sometimes it can be slow. And any error or delay happening at one stage can propagate through the entire pipeline. So the, now the key question here is, you know, can we use convolutional neural nets like, like SquizNet to process the LiDAR data and, uh, to, and provide a better solution. So uh, this is how we formulate this problem. We actually formulate this problem as a point-wise segmentation problem. What I mean is that given the LiDAR point cloud, we want to push that into a convolutional neural net. And then we predict the class of each point inside this cloud. So we know that maybe this cluster corresponds to a car, and this is a, a cyclist, and so on. However, there are two challenges we need to solve here. Uh, the first one is that how do we uh, create data set for this? Because you know, if that's pointwise labeled, do we need to uh, label each point, which is obviously not visible, right? And the second problem is, you know, this data is very sparse and irregularly distributed. How do we feed that into a convolutional new neural net, which is normally processed <coughs> images with very dense and uh, regular structure? So let's talk about uh, how to create data. So first of all, there's no large-scale data set uh, for pointwise labels available. Um, so we actually found a partial solution, which is actually because the, the light open cloud is sparse, you don't need to annotate each point, but instead you can just draw a bunny box, right? And uh, simply treat each point inside the bunny box as part of the object, right? So drawing a bunny box is definitely easier than drawing each point, but however, it's still very difficult. And uh, this way we converted um, the point-wise labels from the existing data set to key data set, about 8,500 for training and 2,800 for, for, for validation. But w this is just a, a, a partial solution because you know, this amount of data is just, just too small and uh, uh, what about when we need more data, right? So I'll talk about uh, more on this a little bit later. So the, the, the point-wise label, do you mean semantic segmentation? Semantic segmentation, okay. yes. So now we have data, but how do we feed the point cloud into a convolutional neural net, right? So as we can see, this is sparse and it's irregularly distributed. So what we do is that we perform a spherical projection such that for each point, 
we compute the element angle and the elevation angle, and then we use these two angles to denote the position of, uh, of each point on the 2D projected uh, sphere. So each point here corresponds to, let's say, a point here, and the, the kind of the value of it, uh, instead of RGB, is actually intensity XYZ measurement that we obtain from, from LiDAR. So this way, if we compare this image with those channels of a LiDAR image, right, you can see that the values are very similar. They, they preserve all the structural information from the image. And also, um, you can see that it's very dense and regularly distributed. So this is good. So we can uh, feed that into a neural network. And now we can turn SwissNet into SwissSAC, which is for LiDAR segmentation. So uh, we keep most of the um, structures the same. So we have this kind of a modules and add some deconvolution. The input is just the LiDAR image that we, we mentioned before. And the output is just a pointwise segmentation or classification map. So we train this network. And here is a visualization of the result. So this is the ground truth. And this is the predict label map. And this is the video reference. And as you can see, you know, qualitatively, it's doing pretty good. And here are some quantitative results. Uh, first, um, so in terms of accuracy, it has a very a pretty good accuracy. This is pointwise accuracy, so which is actually very challenging. But it has good accuracy on the car, and very high recall, which is good, which is good for safety. But maybe not very good for pedestrian cyclists, simply because we don't have enough data. And in terms of the efficiency, it's very good. So the, the fastest version on the Titan X GPU, it can run more than 100 frames per second. And on the, uh, on the uh, GPU that's uh, designed for on driving, it still has a frame rate of 30 frames per second and more. So this is extremely fast and stable. Uh, the model size is 2x smaller than SwissDat, and the energy efficiency is also 2x better. And this work is published at the uh, uh, ICRA uh, last year. So for the stage summary for model efficiency part, so the question is, can we build a neural network to achieve the same accuracy or better accuracy but with lower, uh, lower complexity? So the answer is yes. So we successfully turn SqueezeNet into SqueezeDat for object detection, or image-based object detection, and the SqueezeDat for LiDAR from cloud-based computation. And both of them achieve very good results. Did you say there's a fundamental design principle that enables both of those things? Uh, I'll talk about it later. <laughs> So now let's talk about the, uh, the, the, the data efficiency. So uh, we mentioned that you know, uh, this virtual fault, uh, so neural network requires a lot of uh, amount of data to train, but data annotation can be very difficult, especially for LiDAR. And here's why. So uh, LiDAR, you only have very low resolution, right? So if we just look at these two LiDARs uh, or, or the images, it's very difficult to tell what, what they are until we see the image that corresponds to them, to, to, to these two objects. So we know that this is a traffic pole and this is a cyclist, right? So even we ask a human, it's hard to detect what, what, what kind of object that is. And even if we know uh, what it is, but if we want to draw, let's say, a pointwise label, it's definitely not possible, but if we want to just draw a 3D bunny box around that, this operationally is also very complex because it has more freedom, uh, uh, more degrees of freedom. Right? So therefore, allocating LiDAR from cloud is hard. So the key question here is that, first of all, uh, so the general question is, can we lower the cost of uh, obtaining training data? And more specifically, you know, can we build a, more, a better tool to make the annotation easier? And yet another question is, a uh, more aggressive approach is, can we just use simulated data instead of real data? So to answer the first question, we actually built a LiDAR annotator called LATTE. So LATTE is an annotation tool that uh, uses some advanced features to combat the challenges that, that I mentioned. For the first challenge is, is that uh, LiDAR Point Cloud has low resolution, but we know that for images, normally they have high resolution and image-based detection algorithms are much more mature, so why don't we use image-based uh, detection to help us annotate? So this is how it works. So given uh, on label LiDAR Point Cloud, we uh, first project that to uh, the image, um, and at the same time, we process the image with some uh, uh, image-based detection algorithms, for example, mass cause in so you can, uh, for each pixel here, uh, we can assign that to a certain category. And then for each point in this LiDAR point cloud, we can query this image, and then uh, we can transfer it back, such that we have the uh, labels for the LiDAR point cloud, right? So, so this that, will- so, so that projection tool, you need to have very good calibration. Right, 
so I think normally the, the setup is the, the camera and the light are calibrated. But even if you know there are errors, and the, even if the, the, the detection algorithm are, are not perfect, uh, this is just a pre-label, so the human annotators can still adjust that. So, um, so now this is the first feature. Um, second feature is that we said that you know, annotating is operationally uh, complex, right? So, uh, so our solution is really just to reduce the annotation from joining each point to joining a three debugging box to just one click. The way it works is that you know, given an uh, original point cloud, uh, we ask the annotator to click on the target object, and we use clustering algorithm to grow such that we find all the points that belongs to this object. And then from this point uh, observed, we can estimate, automatically estimate the bounding box around that. And again, if that's not accurate, the human annotator can just tune that. So building all this together um, with Latte, um, the sensor fusion with one click annotation and tracking, which I don't have time to talk about today, uh, we can accelerate the annotation by 6.2x. So what is good? So we, um, the annotation is easier. But can we do better? Can we just use simulated data instead of real data? To answer this question, uh, we built a LiDAR uh, uh, simulator uh, on top of GTA 5. Actually, Xiang Yu built that. Um, so from the video game GTA 5, we can access the images, the depth map, and the labels. And from the depth map, we can convert that to the LiDAR light, light open cloud. And now the label comes for free, right? With this, we can get a large amount of data. However, can we directly utilize this data? Uh, the answer is probably no, right? So if we just train the SquizSec model on the real data, this is the car accuracy that we got. But if we just train them on simulated <coughs> data, this accuracy drops significantly, right? So why is that? So one of the reason uh, is, so this phenomenon is, is, is really referred as domain shift. It means that from the data that the model is trained on to the data that is tested on, the distribution of data is very different, such that it does not generalize. And more specifically, uh, we find that two major reasons um, uh, leads to this domain shift. The first one is lack of dropout noise. So if we compare this uh, synthetic data versus this real data, we can see a, a, a big difference is that the, the synthetic data is too perfect, right? And the real data has a lot of missing points here and there, and the window area, and so on and so forth. And, um, to, to simulate the realistic distribution of this dropout noise is actually quite challenging. And another problem is the lack of intensity. Because on the real data, right, not only we have XYZ, but also intensity channel, which, which is the, the amplitude of the signal that we receive. However, to simulate the intensity in, 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 uh, uh, in realistically is also a challenging problem because it depends on many unknowns, such as uh, surface material and so on and so forth. So the question is, um, you know, um, how do we combat this uh, 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 domain shift? So our first approach was really just to improve the model, such that if the model is not sensitive to such dropout noise, right? So then this this existence or, or absence of, uh, of dropout noise is not going to uh, change the, the the network's behavior, right? So the module that we think think about that can solve this problem is called context aggregation module. And uh, we just directly add that to the squeeze sack. The way to work is the following. So given an input, maybe there's a lot of points missing. We first use a max pooling to process that. So max pooling is very robust towards the um, local missing because the value of it is determined by the largest value. And um, so it's much more robust. So after this max pooling, we use two convolution layers to, to further process that and compute kind of a modulation um, and then uh, use that to, to, to modulate the, the input. So this way, if we, uh, we did a, 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 a numerical experiment, if we increase the dropout noise, the, the error brought by this, um, the error brought by this dropout noise is actually much smaller than if we don't have the cap module. So this is the first solution. Another solution is that we applied a serious trick called uh, domain adaptation. So the idea is that we want the model to transfer from the uh, source domain to the, uh, to, the, to the target domain. So the way we do that is uh, in three steps. First, as we mentioned before, so uh, the in simulated data, we don't have the intensity. But in the real data, although they are not labeled, but they do have the XYZ and the intensity pair. So why don't we train the network to take, to take XYZ as input and to predict what the intensity should be like from the real data? And after this step, we just apply that to the simulated data to render the intensity. 
So the second step we did was that during the training, we did this a step of geodesic correlation alignment. So the idea is that not only we train on the simulated data, but we also train that on the real data without labels. But we try to align the statistics between the simulated uh, batch and the, the, uh, the, the, the real batch, such that uh, to prevent it overheating the simulated data. The last uh, uh, approach we took is called uh, progressive domain calibration. So the idea is that uh, when we apply this model to the, to, to, to the, the target domain, we can find some distribution shift from the input of each neural network over each filter. So uh, we, what we do is that we recalibrate uh, the, the distribution such that they follow the, the nice Gaussian distribution so to make sure that um, the, the, the nonlinearity are working at the uh, comfortable region. So uh, after applying all this, let's check the performance. So again, this is our baseline, so it's basically one model trained on the real data, and this is the accuracy. And this is just trained on the same model on the simulated data. So the accuracy drop is, is big. So what about we add uh, intensity? So adding intensity, the accuracy actually drops, uh, uh, increased to 42. And if we also add the correlation alignment, this number jumps to 48. And if we add the post um, uh, domain calibration, uh, then we have this uh, uh, accuracy of 50.3. Uh, 50 and then if we also add the CAM module, which is to make the model not sensitive to drop out noise, this number jumps to uh, 57.4, which is actually better than the model that's trained on real data, which is very promising because it doesn't mean that we, we don't need real data anymore. However, this is not the end of the story. So uh, by putting the SwissSec V1 plus this CAM module, we call that model SwissSec V2. And if we train this new model, strengthen the model on real data, we see that the accuracy actually improved significantly to 73. So there's still a big gap here, but we can see that this gap is definitely reducing. So you said the uh, work's under review of ICRA, but ICRA's this month. What, whatever happened to it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, it is accepted, sir. Oh, good. <laughs> um, so, so, okay, so a, a stage summary for this section. So we said that um, the key question is, can we lower the cost of obtaining training data, especially with labels? Uh, we actually first we build a tool to make the uh, annotating LiDAR data easier. And another thing is uh, with SwissSec V2, we can actually leverage simulated data and get a very good performance on real data. So next about is, uh, the next thing is about hardware efficiency. Um, we know that you know, we need to co-design the software and the hardware to, make, you know, to, to achieve the, the, the better efficiency improvement. But the reality is there's a big gap between the neural network design and hardware, de and the hardware design. So, on the hardware uh, community, we found that a lot of the innovations are you know, how to make the hardware faster, but when they benchmark the, data, uh, the, the network, they're still targeting some very ancient models like VG16 with very large com uh, complexity. But at, at, at the same time, so in the, in the neural network community, when they design neural network, they're only optimized for you know, fewer flops or um, fewer parameter size, but sometimes they can have very complicated structure that's really hard to map to the hardware. So now the key question is, you know, can we perform uh, co-design, how do we perform co-design to close this gap and uh, uh, to, to get a better uh, improvement of efficiency? So our strategy is to adapt neural network to hardware, and our target hardware uh, is this FDAT Ultra uh, 96 board from Sidings. So uh, it's, it's one of the typical boards for embedded uh, applications. Uh, so, from this uh, hardware characteristic, we can uh, derive our strategy how to design the neural network. So first, uh, this uh, uh, board has very limited computer resources, uh, therefore it cannot run, you know, VG16 or very large models, it ha we have to reduce the model complexity significantly. The second is that this board, uh, its FPG is actually configurable, right? So it allows us to build compute unit that, that, that sacrifices the generality for efficiency. So it can be a very customized compute unit. And, and to leverage this, we need to uh, have a very simplified operator set. So I'll talk about this uh, in detail later. So, um, so first, uh, to reduce the, the model complexity, our starting point is just to choose a, 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 a small model. And then we choose this Shuffleland V2, uh, which is a very small model. So compared with VG16, it has uh, 65 fewer uh, computation ops, and it has 48 fewer parameters and it has a, a decent accuracy on, on ImageNet. If we take a look at 
of the, uh, the, the operators involved in the uh, Schopenhauer degree two, here's what we got. We found that 90% of the computation are attributed to, uh, to one by one convolution, right? Which is actually great because one by one convolution is actually cheaper than you know, spatial convolution of three by three and five by five and so on. But however, so there are still some three by three convolution, uh, three by five source convolution here and there. So now the dilemma is, let's say, how do we build a computer unit? If we build a general computer unit that supports both one by one and three by three, then we, are lo we you know, for gener uh, uh, generality, we have to lose some, some efficiency, right? Or we can build a dedicated unit, uh, one for one by one and one for three by three, but then for the three by three unit, um, we, uh, because it's not heavily used, so we actually lose a lot of, uh, uh, we are wasting uh, hardware resources. So the question is, is that possible that we build a convolutional neural net with only one by one convolution, without any spatial convolutions? Right. So, so one by one convolution just means multiplication by one number, no? Uh, not one number, but so at one position, it has a feature, so that's a vector. Mm -hmm. So one by one convolution can be seen as a, a, a matrix multiplication. Mm -hmm. So you gotta visualize the channel dimension. So it's just one by one in any particular channel, but there's a channel dimension of many layers. So, so we call it one by one, but so it's actually it's one n by n channels, it's n multiplication. One by one by n. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But there's no addition. There is. Yeah. It's a three by three convolution where you've made all of the outside things zero. I see. Right. So, um, so to answer this question, let's first take a look at you know spatial convolution. So, what, so what does it do? Right. Um, so one way to explain what the role of spatial convolution is to say that it's a way to aggregate spatial information. What it means is that, so this is the input uh, feature map or the tensor, this is output. So what does three better convolution do is that at each spatial, uh, it, it's at a, a, a spatial position, it's going to take a small neighbor of three by three uh, and move all the information to the center pixel, right? But the, the way it does it is very computationally expensive because you know all the three by three um, uh, data, uh, uh, including their channels, are used to, to compute. So therefore, it's required a lot of parameters and takes a lot of uh, computation. So the question is: Is there a more economical way to do this? Um, so one uh, proposal, that, uh, one solution that we thought about is called the shift operation. So how it works is the following: So given an input tensor at each position it directly copy the data from this neighborhood pixel to the center position. So for example, at this uh, position, at this channel, it's going to move the, the purple neighborhood to the center. But at a different channel, it's going to move a different neighborhood to the center. And because this operation is kind of convolutional, so this is repeated at all the spatial positions, this is equivalent to shifting the entire channel towards one direction, but another channel towards another di uh, direction. So after this shift, uh, what happens at the output is that at the same spatial position across the channel, it contains all the information from, from this small region. So in other way, it aggregates for uh, uh, spatial information. So one great thing about this shift is that when it's diffused with one by one convolution, the shift is, is in some sense free because you don't need to you, you don't need to use floating point operation to compute it. You don't even need to uh, move the data actually because what you can do is, is, is just uh, load the data from a shifted address for this one by one convolution and, and that's it, right? So with this uh, shift plus one by one convolution, we can finally turn this shuffle net V2 into a new network called direct delta net where the only computational uh, unit, uh, uh, computation operation is this one by one convolution. Or you can say it's actually a matrix, a matrix multiplication. Um, so this allows us, uh, so the reason why we call it direct delta net is again, so because it's evolving with one by one convolution is equivalent to evolving with a direct delta function. So this allows us to build a FPGA accelerator where the only compute unit is a one by one convolution and we can do, do that uh, fairly fast. And uh, now compare its accuracy versus the, the efficiency with the previous state of the art, although so they are all on, um, Excuse me, um, can you back up? I just, sure. uh, sorry to give us through your, your whole talk, but you would have never gotten a thousand of those on a little FPGA if you hadn't done that one by one convolutional reduction. Right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so now we can, um, 
So compared with the previous state of R on the embedded FPG boards, we can have the highest accuracy and the frame rate 11.6x higher than the previous one. So I guess uh, for, for the state check, um, so the question is can we perform co-design to achieve better efficiency? The answer is yes. So the two uh, uh, papers that I talked about, one is the shift operator, which is published at CVPR last year as well as oral paper, and the CNFG uh, is about the FG, uh, accelerator that's published at FG1 uh, this year. So last, I want to talk about this design efficiency. Um, uh, so let's first use an example to understand what's the cost of designing a neural network. And this is a real example. So again, SwissNet, which is kind of a pioneering work of building efficient and small networks. So with, with SwissNet compared with AppsNet, again, this 50x parameter reduction, right? But how did Forrest come up to this design, right? Behind that, he actually tried, he trained 1,000 new architectures, right, explore. So there's a lot of you know, variations you need to, to choose, you know, what's the channel size, what's, and so on and so forth. So he trained 1,000 of them, and each of them is taking 32 GPU for 12 hours. So if, I think he, he run this on, on a, a national lab data center, but if this is to be run on uh, AWS, then the cost is gonna be $350,000. This is probably more than the salary I received from Berkeley in my past six years. <laughs> I'm not complaining. <laughs> um, Too late anyway. <laughs> so, so now the key question is that, you know, why designing your network is so expensive, and you know, can we lower the cost, and uh, can we, so first of all, let's, let's uh, take a look at what, what are the challenges of designing a neural network, right? So the first challenge is really just intractable design space. So let's just take a very simple example. So VG16 is you know, a classical model, has 16 layers. If we are going to redesign that, right? Uh, the kernel size we can choose from you know, one, three, five, and the channel size we can choose from five different channel sizes. And this already gives us a design space for possible architectures that we can never explore. So another challenge is that the optimality of the neural network is actually dependent on a lot of factors, um, such as uh, you know the target device that you deploy to, or you know the computation task, or the, the budgets that you can spend uh, on, on, in terms of uh, flops and, and parameter size and so on. Uh, how, so ideally, we should design a different neural network for each of this uh, scenario. But ideally, due to the cost of designing and training neural networks. We can only afford to design one and apply it to all the different uh, the conditions, which is definitely not optimal. The third one is this really this uh, in a, what I call this inaccurate efficient efficiency metrics, because you know previous works on uh, designing efficient neural networks, most of them focus on reducing the parameters or flops, which are actually the proxies of the actual uh, latency we care about, which is latency and uh, the, the energy or so on. Um, however, uh, so sometimes, and, and this can lead to problems, so a, a network with lower flop does not necessarily mean it's actually faster. For example, this uh, NASNet A, again, so we use this example again, so it actually has slow, uh, smaller flops than the mobility one, but the latency is 1.6x slower. What is the alternative? Can we directly design with latency? So this is a visualization of the, you know, the op uh, convolution operator, the input output versus the latency. As you can see, this is a very highly nonlinear and noisy measurement such that it's probably not, not very intuitive or, or even possible for human to, to memorize all this and, and find, the, find the best uh, 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 network. So the, the, the question is how do we deal with this and do, do our previous design approach uh, solve, solve these problems? So uh, let's first review the, some of the design approaches. The first one is you know, the one that we use every day, which is called manual design. So uh, we start from, you know, made implicitly from the search space. Uh, we roughly know where to tune. And we manually come up with a architecture, and we uh, train it on the target data set. And then we get latency and accuracy. And if you are not happy with it, if it's too slow or it's not accurate enough, then maybe you, you do, do some change uh, iteratively. And um, you repeat this process again and again and again, but remember you only have five or six years of PhD, so you cannot do this forever. So uh, you have to stop, right? But after you stop, maybe you cannot fully explore the design space, so the, the design is suboptimal. So this is not good. So recent years, there's a, a new trend of research called neural architecture search. Uh, so the way it works is following. So again, let's explicitly design some search space. 
And let's use some controller to sample an architecture from this search space. Right? And then we train this on the target data set to measure the latency and accuracy. And then we use the signal to train the controller so that next time you know how to sample better. So uh, th this, this kind of uh, this set of methods were very successful. So they uh, d discussed a bunch of models that surpassed the human uh, human design. However, the problem with it is that this is just too computationally expensive. The reason why is um, so it needs a lot of um, it needs to enumerate a lot of the neural architectures to train and to to, to, to train those controllers to to how to predict the next one. And training each of the neural network is actually very computationally expensive. So as a matter of fact, uh, this work by Google called MNASNet, they uh, uh, spend 21, uh, 91,000 GPU hours to find the, 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 uh, the, the right model. So this is probably good for Google, but definitely not for, good for Berkeley. So uh, how to solve this problem? I think the key here is to avoid this paradigm of you know, enumerating and training each indiv uh, individual uh, uh, neural network uh, uh, independently. So this is uh, our approach, it's called differentiable neural architecture search. Uh, the way it works is the following. So again, we start from a search space, and we assemble this search space into a stochastic supernet. What I mean is that with the supernet, uh, each layer has several operators, and we can randomly choose one according to some distribution. Such that we want, when we run the inference, um, it's going to sample an operator and compute, and add another layer, sample and compute, and, and repeat this process. And at the end, we can compute some sort of loss function, right? It could be, so the loss function here not only consider the accuracy of this network, but also the actual latency of it. How do we measure the actual latency? So essentially, we benchmark the search space or the operators in the search space onto the target device such that the uh, latency of this uh, sample network is just summation of all the, uh, all the uh, latency of each uh, individual oper operators. So this way, this loss function can, uh, can, can consider both the accuracy and the actual latency. And then we train this network. First, um, not only with respect to the weights of the operator, which just like we normally train a neural network, but we also train uh, the probability distribution of how we should sample. For example, if one operator gives very good accuracy and the latency is low, we should sample that more often. Otherwise, we just suppress that. So after training converges, we can sample from this probability and find a set of neural architectures um, that are that are uh, accurate and efficient. So uh, the, the 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 advantage of this is that you know instead of training thousands of networks uh, uh, independently, we only train the supernet just once, and uh, we can optimize for the actual latency. Excuse me, I'm a little bit confused. There's no registered delay elements in this. It's just a bunch of multiplies on that. So where is the latency coming from? Is the time it takes to do a multiply and the time it takes to add, or Right, so here, each uh, operator here is actually kind of a, a, a convolution operator. Yeah. So although it's just multiplied, but um, multiplied add, but that cannot happen in parallel. It has to be scheduled and uh, you know, to feed into a small cache in LU, so it's computer, so it does take a lot of time. I see, so it's the resource bottleneck of not having infinite amount of multipliers on that. Right, which we so never have. So isn't that, the latency that is a function of the size of that cache. Yeah. There's also layers. Yeah. Yeah, but, but those are all deterministic. If I give you a network, I can calculate it on a piece of paper. Well, that's that's why this technique works, is that it's additive. But, I'm, I'm, but I thought, I, I guess I don't understand your question. I think he kind of answered it. Oh, okay. If, if, no, if, no, if no, the multiplies and adds, if I had infinite number of multipliers and adders, there's zero latency. There's no, if I draw an IIR filter, there's Z inverse, there's a delay, there's a register. That causes delay. No, there, there are lots there's of no, registers in this. There's, there's many no, but, but there's no, you don't, you don't, there's no, um, anyway, it, it, it's, it's just, it, It's not zero work depth. The work depth, because there's data dependencies, means its latency is bounded. It can't be zero. But, but if you had, if you had infinitely fast multipliers and adders. But you're still in well, time fast. to compute. That's no, no, so if, if the, if there was zero time to compute, then yes, it would be zero. Okay, yeah. so That's really the, the source of latency is the computation. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. What else would it be? A, a real z to the minus one delay in, a, in, a, in an IIR filter, for example, that that slows things down, that causes a delay. Input at this time, you get yeah. shifted by. We're talking about hardware. Yeah. And hardware right. work. Yeah. Right. But here, so the reality is, the computation burden is so much larger than uh, your, 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 your computer 
do this, so therefore we definitely need a lot of time to do that. And you know, it, it, it's possible to, to, to build a simulator to, to predict that, but in our case, we actually just benchmark that because then we think that's perfectly more accurate. So uh, we use this method, DNAS method, to find uh, efficient income that. Um, so the way we do it is that to treat each operator, um, kind of operator here as a module that contains a, a series of uh, operators one by one, convolution, you know, uh, three by three depth size convolution, and another one by one convolution, and with a lot of kind of tunable parameters of you know, the kernel size or the, the channel size, or you can just skip this, uh, this module entirely. And the result is compared with the state of our manually designed model called MobileNet V2, uh, we can uh, achieve uh, better accuracy with much lower latency. And compared with MNASNet, which is the uh, model uh, automatically discovered by Google, it got slightly better accuracy and slightly better latency, but in terms of the search cost, right? So this is another realization with the flops and accuracy and the size of it is the search cost. So here, here we are. So our method only take eight GPUs for 24 hours to find the optimal model, whereas for MNASNet, it takes 91,000 GPU hours to find the model with, with equal accuracy, well, with slightly worse accuracy and, 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 and latency, and also flops. And also compared with other neural architecture search method, we also achieve, um, we also have a big advantage. So this, because this is so fast, and it considers actual latency, this allows us to search for different networks, for different target devices. So in our exper uh, experiment, we tried on the uh, 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 iPhone with A11 chip, and the Samsung S8 with Snapdragon A35 chip, we run the same algorithm, but we just use a different measurement of the latency for each operator, and we find two models with almost the same accuracy, but if we benchmark the two models on an iPhone X, we see that th this model optimized for iPhone X 1.4x faster, whereas if we benchmark everything on Samsung S8, the model uh, optimized for Samsung S8 is actually faster. So this tells us two things. So first, I think you went to the little. Can you go to the little slower? Sure. So the two models, one is optimized for iPhone X, and the other one is optimized for Samsung S8. We benchmark both. So iPhone X one is in blue. Is in blue, yes. And the label underneath is which processor or which, oh, which processor it's running on. Exactly. So on the iPhone X, this model that is optimized for iPhone X is one one point four x faster, whereas on the S8. You know the the, uh, the the one that optimized for S8 is actually better. So this tells us two things. So uh, first, uh, it is necessary to actually to synthesize different neural networks for different hardware devices. And secondly, this uh, DNS method can uh, 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 very efficient, efficiently find the, the, the model. So um, this is the summary for the design efficiency part. So we, we know that you know, designing neural networks is taking a lot of time and money and so on. So the, the question is, can we automate this process? And the answer is yes. So with DNAS, uh, with you know very low computational cost, eight hour, uh, eight GPUs for 24 hours, we can find models with state of our accuracy and efficiency, and can optimize for different target devices. Are, so are you going to publish this work? Or huh? are you going to publish this work? Or? Sorry, uh, th this this work is accepted by uh, 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 CBPR this year as an oral paper. You have to make decisions about the particular motifs that you compose. Uh, right. So there is a human design element to this. Yes, the human design element is then just how to design the search space, uh, which still requires a lot of intuition and so on. But that's. So do you have? So this is my other question. So what is the intuition I should be using when building the search spaces? Right. What are the design principles? Uh, so. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so, so. I think the the uh, the answer to that is still pretty empirical. Right? Well, I have a converse question, which may may get to the same point, which is what are the biggest limitations you have in the way you define your search space? Right. So the limitation. So I think it's still based on a lot of uh, human intuition. So oh, I should put a pulling here. Oh, what's the channel size? Approximately, might be. It's probably not a good idea to put a lot of channel size in the first stage, and so on and so forth. But I think what, 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 what it provides is that, okay, I'm pretty sure that one direction that the intuition is correct, but I don't know which exactly to choose, so we put everything together. So, but, I'm sorry, this is sounding a little bit. There, the search space is all your models will have 22 layers. Right. right? And they have, a, they have a fixed down sampling right. regime, right? 
right. and you only have so much choice of the spatial convolutions at each layer. Right. 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 So those. Those are definitely the, the some of the constraints. And you've arrived at those empirically. Yes. But those are those are still pretty severe constraints in space. Uh, for that's I. So yes, I mean, we, we, in some sense, we're still constrained in, in, in kind of a design space that's that that's you know uh, proven by the previous human behavior. I mean, it's possible that we can design, we can have an entirely wild design space and let that an, uh, RL agent to explore inside that. Maybe it can find us totally different. Um, I think that might be a wild research direction to explore next. Um, but if we just really care about you know the practical latency and, and so on and so forth, maybe we cannot deviate too much from, from what, what we have now. That's my intuition. Yeah. Okay, um, so now this is the summary. So uh, in this talk, we discussed three factors that contribute to the success of these neural networks, more data, more complex model, and more compute. But those are not available on um, the uh, edge. So to address this, um, uh, my research focused on improving efficiency at four different levels. Model efficiency, we designed squeeze and squeeze set and achieved um, better, uh, a faster speed energy efficiency. And data efficiency, we build tools to make animation easier, and then we utilize simulated data. And hardware efficiency by co-design the operator and also the FV accelerator we achieved a much faster inference compared with previously of the art. And with um, Venus, we discovered a, a family of models called F by the way, this, this set of models is called FVNet and for Facebook plus Berkeley. So Berkeley has an important role in there. Um, so with a state of our accuracy and, and efficiency. So this is a summary and these are the publications related to the talk today. Um, so finally I'd like to thank you. So first thank Peter as my advisor and thank all my collaborators from Berkeley, uh, Facebook, and, uh, and Google, and Silings, and thank you for your support uh, all along.